Sorry, I just mentioned the, how to keep Kidla Tahimik in line. <laughs> and uh, that's almost impossible. Um, and we today already, we, we started offline. Oh, online, offline. Sounds like... Um, I couldn't find my eyeglasses. I couldn't find my drive because I wanted to show some examples of uh, clips from my film. But as a third world filmmaker, I'm always ready. So I have my analog uh, escultura de madera. I have my, my body to make up for the digital loss. So, yeah, they call this a master class. And I don't know, maybe, for me it's not appropriate. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure uh, Gus Van Sang and uh, I guess Terry Gilliam are also having their own master classes. Um, you know, just for your information, I, I just completed a 35-year-old film, a film I made for 35 years which I will try to show samples of. And uh, it's really against the rules of a straight line filmmaking. I took years to, 35 years to wander here and there until, oops, oh, I crossed the finish line. It was a, if I tell, you know, when I, I started Economista, you established Economista 45 years ago. And then I said, no, it's too much the rule to stay on track, to be a good banker, to be a good uh, minister of Economist. You must stay on track. And my whole being an artist today, why I'm here, why my crazy films are being shown in different parts of the world, is because I, I did not stay on track, I strayed on track. I don't know how the translator is going to translate <laughs> that. But anyway, instead of the straight line and do your, like maybe go to film school, get a master, a PhD in, in blockbuster filmmaking, and then whew, go to Hollywood, that straight path, and be a Harvey Weinstein, somebody like that. <laughs> I was going here, and then if I hit, like a billiard ball, you hit another billiard ball, you go there, and you go here, you go there, and somehow you reach the finish line. About um, 1987, well, that's about 30 years ago, I was invited to a conference in Duke University. And I um, had to do a paper. And I'm not used to doing a paper. I usually talk spontaneously and my thoughts come together, partly because of the audience, partly because of yesterday's happenings, yesterday's screenings, yesterday's questions. And they become a, a central core for what I'm going to talk about. And at that conference, uh, I remember I was on an airplane and I was using my portable typewriter. They did not have yet a uh, Mac. Uh, laptops in those days, 1987, and I had to type the title of my my paper because they said if you don't have a paper, you cannot get an honorarium. <laughs> so I had to write, and I was we had a 10-hour flight across the Pacific, and I was able to get my paper done, and I typed the title. And I was comparing my way of filmmaking. I call it cups of gas filmmaking, okay? Cups of gas, you put uh, una taza de gasolina en su coche, eh, 
après, euh, après quelques kilomètres, stop, stop, stop. You stop, you beg, you steal, you borrow the next cup of gas, you pour it into your car, put, 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 put. you reach another place, but little by little, you get to the end of your journey, okay? So I call it Cups of Gas Filmmaking, which is for people with no budget, people with just a strong duende to make you make your film, tell your story. And now this is in comparison to the, yeah, to the Harvey Weinstein way. You, it's, I call it full-time cum credit card filmmaking. Okay? You have plotted your way from East Coast to West Coast, you know, every gasoline station that you need to fill up. You have your full tank. Maybe you have a few canisters of gasoline or diesel in your trunk. And you have your credit card. So maybe you make from East Coast to West Coast in two weeks. And you're there. It's an efficient route. But my way, East, West, Southwest, East, West, Northwest, but then I finally get to the West Coast, and that is my cups of gas filmmaking. Now, when I was typing my paper, I accidentally, you know, when you make a typographical error, you press the wrong key. So I wrote cups of gas filmmaking, F I L M M A K I N, filmmaking. Then when I put versus cups of gas filmmaking, I, I spell it F I L L M A K I D. Film making. Okay? What's the Spanish? Well, my translator will tell that. <laughs> so instead of film making, it was film making. I said, oh. <laughs> it's a cosmic typographical error. It says it all. I'm making films, I'm telling stories. My duende is trying to share something with whoever will be my audiences. But the filmmaking is like the grocery shelf. No? Take out the can and fill up the next can. There's a dog food can out, put up the next dog food on the shelf. So I think Hollywood is very much of the filmmaking approach. It's driven for a profit. So you have a high turnover of dog food or ketchup or TV dinners and that's the main purpose but I think when you're an independent filmmaker you're often driven by your inner duende I'll explain what the duende is your inner driving force I must tell this story and so you're a film maker not a film maker I hope that this can be translated into Spanish <laughs> But that sums up, in a way, what I've been trying to do for the last 45 years. I started filmmaking about 1975. I finished my first film, uh, The Pesadilla Parfumada, uh, in 1977. Maybe it was too good to be true. It, it was a, a very strong encouragement to my fi filmmaking style. My first film created waves at the Berlinale, the Berlin Film Festival. I'm not bragging about it, I just say that it was too good to be true for me. I was just looking for an audience. You know, you know when, you, when you're a painter or a writer, you, you just want to at least to get an audience, you know, somebody to read it. You're not looking for the big big, big, wide audience. You're looking for some, but just some feedback. So sometimes for us, well, I think many filmmakers here will know that uh, the big distributor is really way out of our reality and you're happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, it's a way of um, still telling our stories, but you get somebody say, hey, that's a funny story. Or say, hey, that's, 
I couldn't understand your story. You look for a cold audience, and that film festival is always a way to get your first cold audience. You know, it's very easy to fill up your first screening with all your amigos and amigas, you know, so everybody's there, and after they look at the film, I say, oh, pare, es mucho, es uh, cute. Oh, I liked your, well, everybody's sympathetic to you, but when you have a cold audience, you have some people say, hey, I found that too hard, or hey, I want, or I walked out at <laughs> this place. So I got my first cold audience in the Berlinale, Berlin Film Festival. And I think I got a pat on the back. Bueno, bueno, it was uh, the cold audience and the critics. And I was encouraged to do my Cups of Gas filmmaking, which I have followed for the last 45 years. It means I do with the resources I have, well, maybe I'll, I can save for six months a little money to buy a few rolls of film. I started with film. I was really using, you know, this thing you call film. We filmmakers call it spaghetti, because when the film starts falling down, it's like, a, it's hard to annoy it like a spaghetti um, dish. And even a few rolls of time, a few cups of gas at time, my film would get completed and I would one day let it go so it could be shown in the film festival. And this is very different from the kind of filmmaking where you have to I'm sorry if I hear myself <laughs> through a Spanish voice I get distracted. Um, when you When you work this way, with cups of gas filmmaking, you have an open deadline. You don't have a producer <laughs> breathing down your back. You have to finish in one month, and we have a play date in two months because the bank is going to collect money from me, the producer, in three months. You know, and that kind of pressure makes you. I think you lose your fun making your films. Yesterday, uh, one of the people in the audience said that oh, they liked the, fil uh, the film because it was playful, it had a feeling of being family-like, it had a feeling of being relaxed, and I said, well, maybe. That's because I didn't have an, a banker with an MBA pushing me every minute of the way. And I could just, yeah, do my cups of gasoline, stop, do it another here. Maybe that's why my last film, which I'll show clips of later, um, it's about the Viaje de Magallanes. No? But I was more interested in the Esclavo de Magallanes, not Magallanes. And because I was interested in that slave who might have been the first person to circumnavigate the globe. Not Magellan. Magellan died in the Philippines. Hey, hey, Lapu Lapu! <laughs> Our chieftain who killed Magallanes. Um, Magallanes lacked 900 kilometers more to complete his voyage. Yeah? But the slave, somehow because he went with Magallanes all the way around, had come back to an island where he could speak the language, where he learned the language. So maybe the first man to go around the world was a Filipino. Well, we were not Filipinos then, we were, you know, Philip, for those of you who saw my film yesterday. <laughs> Philip was the, were named after the Rey de España, Felipe II, creo. And in my film, one of the artists tells my son, Philip, Philippines, but you know that King Philip died of syphilis, and that's why our name Philippines sounds like Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a karma we have to break. I think our country is having many problems. 
because uh, we still have the karma of King Philip. But never mind, back to the, yeah, so maybe instead of a master class, let's just call this the Esclavo class, okay? <laughs> and in 35 years I was doing that film. And um, so, but whether it's taking 35 years or even five years to finish, or even two years, if you're working with your own time frame, and your own time frame is not the banker's time frame or the producer's time frame, but it's the time frame of the cosmos. You're playing ping pong with the cosmos and you're enjoying it. You can stop playing when, well, and the ball can go slow motion and then you're taking a vacation and then catch the next ball. Sometimes you have to put energy and then you wait five years, you know, and somehow 35 years will buy, pass by so fast. Yes, maybe it wasn't so fast, but uh, my son, Gawaiyan, was uh, two-year-old, one-year-old, when I started the film in 1979, the Magallanes film, and I stopped the film Again, waiting for the ping pong ball to come, I stopped about 1988, maybe 10 years. And I said, I will come back to the film, maybe in five years, eight years, 10 years. But the eight years, 10 years became 15, 20, until it became 35 years. And I don't know why, I'll show you later anyway footages, but I think, I was waiting for my one-year-old son to develop a big balbas, balbas, barba. You see, the Filipino say balbas. I think it's a orientalization of barbas. It's making him balbas. <laughs> but when he grew up a nice blue beard, I think he. I said, "Oh, now I know why we were delayed 35 years." My old Magellan had died in the film. I uh, had died, and I was looking for a new Magellan. <laughs> My son grew up to become the next Magellan. So this is how you play with the cosmos, okay? Cosmos means opening up your time frame. Of course, it's very hard to do if you're working for Hollywood, or even, not even for Hollywood, for any producer. And <clears throat> I cannot recommend this to everybody. But just for the sake of comparison for my paradigm is I don't like to believe in the dictum, you know, the main dictum that's ruling the world today. Time is money. <laughs> Have you heard that? Time is money. Dinero is the tempo. Huh? El tiempo es dinero. And already, when we were young, we learned that we have to get our schedule, we have to catch the bus, we have to be at school at this time. Uh, it becomes a way of life. And I think when you have that way of life and you, you stick too much to it, maybe you're shutting out the cosmic contributions to your, to your painting, to your novel, or to your film. No? It's an echo chamber. We live in this echo chamber. Okay, you know what an echo chamber is. Just every day you're hearing the things that, let's say, oh, democracy is good, or communism is bad, or uh, to have a Rolls Royce is good, to, uh, to go to the disco is, wow, cool. So all this echo chamber makes us consumers, makes us good economic citizens, and therefore we have to follow that echo chamber. But sometimes you have to break out of that echo chamber and say, hey, I want to take my own time. I want to see what I see, not what my teacher told me to see, my professor told me to see, the frame of my producer, the frame of uh, my, my, my madre and my padre. We have to slay the father or the mother. You know the Shakespearean, let's slay the father so we can be who we are. 
Now I'm not talking about the ego of who we are in the sense, I must be me, I must be me. I'm just saying, let's break out of the prisons of our echo chamber. And then maybe we can be free to be storytellers, okay? So as a master class today, um, or uh, as clavo class, I, uh, I like to maybe help ping pong with you uh, if you want to have that craziness, that freedom of uh, some of the films that I've shown the last few days. Uh, maybe the cosmos may be lucky enough that I, I did not go to film school. I'm not saying film schools are bad, but I think watch out. Sometimes a film school can put a, a straight jacket around you and you're not as free uh, to tell your story. And especially a medium like film, it's so complicated in terms of technology and when you add to that the layers of uh, rules from the seven arts, you have to have good actors, you have to good lighting, you have to good, have good uh, exena. It becomes, and then you have the bankers protocols, you know. All these make it so difficult to tell a story. So, let's say Kitla Tahimik is not a movie maker, in the same sense of the word movie, but let's just say I'm a storyteller who happened to use film. Well, in the 40 years ago it was film, película, spaghetti, and now of course it's video. You don't have that physical noodles, but it's a new technology that changes and maybe even makes faster the, the deadlines for your storytelling. But again, we step out of we step out of that echo chamber of time is money, and maybe you can tell a story that the world is waiting for. Usually, we have to do the formula story because there's a deadline, and because we have to pay the bankers one time or the producer has to do that. Okay, this is not a course on economics. <laughs> um, so, let's, okay, today, yeah, time is money, I mean, there is a time frame, we have to be finished at one o'clock. <laughs> but let me see how I can best um, share with you uh, what makes Kitlanta Himix Duende tick, no? I don't think I'm a film genius. I'm only able to do the stories because I have a co-director of the Cosmos or a co-director of the indigenous tribes that live around my city or I have a family that got westernized through education, or shall we call it colonization. So this, this combination um, makes my duende have a very special frame of the world. I realize that duende is a Spanish word, but we use it in the Philippines like uh, a duende of that rock or the duende of the mountain, or the duende of the river. Uh, it talks about a certain spirit within that rock or the forest. And I like to think of it as a, a playful, creative energy inside each of us. Think of, yeah, an, an energy that can tell stories. But if you let your duende tell your story with its special frame. My duende has this frame, your duende has maybe that frame, your duende has maybe that frame, but it's a frame. And it's that unique frame that I think independent filmmakers want to share. And where does that, that unique 
storytelling, where do they come from? Now, I don't want to sound like a theoretical academician, okay? I'm just creating a, uh, a metaphor, maybe which any of you people who want to become a filmmaker, and it's never too late to become a filmmaker or a storyteller, okay? So, let me just give a favorite example of mine. Uh, we're talking about creativity now, okay? and we'll show samples later. When I talk about the duende, please don't think it's something like from a Harry Potter film, <laughs> you know, the smoke. There's a duende there. The duende is inside us, okay? It's a form of a ganado, an energy to, to share something with somebody else or with an audience. Our duende is composed of that energy that comes from two, for me, two major influences. One is your personal upbringing, how you grew up, your family life when you were a child. So my favorite example is, for example, if your father was a military person, ah, dos plus dos no es cinco. Ah, no, it's ah, ah, ah. I hope you don't have a father like that. <laughs> or another example is if your father was a very gentle artist. Ah, hijo, pero dos plus dos, no sé yo. Let's see where it goes. Let's see where it goes. Now, these two kind of upbringings, <laughs> your, fra your framing of the world already is affected. No? Now, the other major influence on your duendes framing is your culture, no? your culture. Okay. Uh, your culture um, makes you familiar with certain things and makes you make unfamiliar with other things. So, okay. If you grew up in a village in the Philippines where, okay. <laughs> Some of you saw me yesterday with my performance. Um, yeah. If you see a uh, person, well, let me, <laughs> let me open up a, if you see somebody walking around in a taco rabo. <laughs> Let me go back to my costume. Okay. And uh, you grew up in a village where taco rabo is normal, no? So you see the person walking around in the taco rabo. And it's normal, no? But if you grew up in the city, maybe you were a colegiada in a very uh, escuela exclusiva. And you see somebody walking out in the taporabo and say, ah, pompa. Is that correct, pompa? Yeah. I learned that word yesterday, thank you. It's a, uh, you frame it maliciously because maybe your Catholic culture or your New York culture says it's uncivilized to wear a taporabo. But if you come from a cultura where it's normal, you don't notice it. Maybe you say, ah, that taporabo is woven by my grandmother. <laughs> you know? And you see other things that others don't see. So when you combine your cultural influence on you and your personal growth, the kind of parents you had or the kinds of teachers you had, I think you will very have a very different combination. And of course, then you can add the political situation of the world. Today, everybody is, is worrying about the rightist movement towards Trump and Duterte and other, what's the name of the Brazilian president? I mean, everybody's, so that will affect also the way you frame your films. No? Or when we were in the 19, uh, 72, we were having Le Le Marshall and 
our President Marcos became a tighter and tighter rule, control over the Filipinas, and finally the Filipinos had to break out. That's my film this afternoon, Why is Yellow Middle of the Rainbow? That was the in initial Duende drive to tell that story. And so political circumstances, social circumstances will also eventually affect how you tell your story, how you make your film, how you write your novel, okay? I know, I think, you know, I've been talking about the Duende as a driving force, maybe like in contrast to money as a driving force, or fame, I'll be a glorious Harvey Weinstein producer, you know. You always are different motivations for making a film, but when it's just a simple storytelling, I think that's why I chose the, the metaphor for Duende, because it's also a word in Filipinas. No? But somebody uh, at the last festival in Tui, uh, in España, Kalashikali, somebody asked me, uh, have you read Garcia Lorca? Because he talks about the Duende of the flamenco dancer now. And that person told me a little bit about how it was. I said, well, I've never read Garcia Lorca, but yes, I think I'm talking about that inner, inner, the inner fire, no? the fuego, the artista, the fuego, the flamenco dancer, the fuego, the, the uh, Ecuador de Novela. Uh, this fire, I think, is the most important thing when you're telling a story. Now, people who are in the Hollywood school, maybe the fire will come from the fact that after the film you will make a million dollars. That's a kind of fire, too. But that becomes an exclusive for a small group of uh, people who can get into the Hollywood circles, no? But for the rest of the world, which is maybe 97%, and you want to tell a story, and want to use film for telling a story, well, you have to find other ways. But finding other ways is one thing, and... <sighs> ganado, you know? Is that the word, ganado? Yes. You're ganado to finish your, to make that story, then you depend on your, what is, everybody has. Everybody has that energy. You just have to discover your duende, nurture your duende, and let it go. <laughs> let its voice say, ah, this is my story. And you don't have to have a, a producer telling you over the, over your shoulder, hey, we have to have seven sex scenes before the end of the film, or in 45 minutes in the film, we have to <laughs> That's what happens when you surrender to the duende of the producer. <laughs> I mean, duendes have their own, uh, producers have their own duendes who want to do their own thing, but let's stick to our creative duende as storytellers, whether filmmakers or whatever looking towards a commercial film industry, then I think that limits my choice of stories. Because I know that they will only produce a film that has the formula, okay? What's a formula? It's you repeat it and you will get the same thing. So two plus two is cinco cuatro, okay? Um, <clears throat> Some meat plus some spices plus a bun will always give you a Big Mac <laughs> or uh, mixing water with some sugar and some coca will give you a, a soft drink. So repeating the formula is basically what runs the industry. When you let your duende tell its story, then maybe you can step, you can do your own. Storytelling that maybe won't earn a million dollars from a million uh, 
from 50,000 people watching your film. But maybe your original story will excite a few people who go to film festivals like you, because it's a bit different when you're tasting. Yeah, this is that uh, boring hamburger. Oh, this, uh, this mole has 120 ingredients. Ooh. From the days of the Aztecs. And although it's not as sensational as a, a fried chicken from KFC or, or a Starbucks, whatever, it's something different. And maybe this is what the world is waiting for. And the days of just one big mass market that could be calculated by the, by the economists in Hollywood and would create the formula that would create that blockbuster, maybe the days are, it won't be finished, it will be, there will always be a market for that, but I think with platforms like YouTube and other ways of showing the not blockbuster money-making film, there's more possibilities for us, for our story to reach there. So, okay, um, good stories. These Hollywood stories come the commercial way, and since our country is following the capitalistic model of America, we have malls, we have cineplexes, they will only show films that are profitable, so all the stories of Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, Captain America, they come and flood our, our cultural scene. And the children don't anymore hear the story of Inambian, the goddess of the wind. All they get are stories about super people with wearing masks. <laughs> I don't know why they're wearing masks. <laughs> and they are using technology, laser beams, and uh, all kinds of things. And anyway, we forget these stories. Or not, we don't even hear the stories anymore. So maybe as an independent cineast, so that we can tell the story of Inabian, trying to keep at bay, trying to keep away Distancia Viga, so that we can tell our own stories, okay? So here I'm playing with some wood carvings that I brought from my country. Uh, in my film about Magallanes Village, about Magallanes Viaje, <laughs> um, I play the esclavo, and I'm a wood carver there, so I've learned to do some wood carving, but I have to have it finished by some good wood carvers from Ifugo. So, who's going to spread the story of Inambian? Okay, enter the independent filmmaker with his bamboo camera. Okay. So. You know, brown skin. Let's let the independent filmmaker tell the story with his own Puerto de Vista. And this is symbolized by my bamboo camera. For those of you who saw my performance yesterday, I bring out the bamboo camera as a metaphor. A metaphor that we can tell stories with our own point of vista, our own point of view, okay? We don't have to use that point of view of the duendes of Hollywood. We don't have to be motivated by the money-making machine that chooses only the stories that are part of the echo chamber today. Ah, more sex, oh, that's cool, man. Oh, wow, more ta 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 By the way, <laughs> I noticed when I came up here the road, coming to the convention center, there was a big billboard of the GIF, the Guanato, Guanato Film Festival. 
And on the other side was another big billboard with somebody with a sniper. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a it's an advertisement for the police academy or something like that. But wow, how strong these images are are really dominating our life. You cannot even get away from it. You ride on a bus and the the screen on the bus is showing you go to a, even the sounds, no? Yesterday I was showing my film in the Pequeño um, cinema, and there was this boom, 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 boom. They were just sound, test sounding, but you know, I mean, it's nice to have the sound when you're in a disco, no? but when you're just for every day, it's, and even small villages now, they have the little. Uh, well, they, we even used to have the, the Walkman and things like that. They always boom, 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 boom. Somebody told me that some psychologists have said that they're using this in the malls now, so you, it's a psychological tool, so you will buy more. I don't know, but the, we can't get out of this commercial echo chamber that, because sometimes you want just to hear your duende voice in you. Helping you create a new story, a new situation for a film. But, and that's part of our awareness that we need, that we have to get out of that echo chamber. We have to step out so that we can be ourselves. So, I have my little installation here. This already can be a movie sequence. Sometimes I'm reading in the internet their big. Uh, paranoia now in, in America and in Europe. Um, people are getting very negative about their their environment, their, their stature. They feel that they read about the global warming. And there are many people who have what they call a climate grief. <laughs> I don't know if that's a... Anyway, a friend wrote me, ah, she's so depressed because she has climate grief. Maybe in the world where you cannot interact so much with a fellow human being and you just interact with your machines and then you read about the spectacular news about melting glaciers and polluted rivers. And even if you're not a fan of Donald Trump's economic policies, you may start coming down, but, okay, I think, and I see this in Mexico, and like also in my country, uh, we still have a culture that is uh, um, very compassionate, no? muy simpatico. Uh, uh, there's more contact between me and the other. Let me just uh, give a brief diversion. You know, we have a old indigenous value, core value in the Philippines, which I feel like I also sense here. Maybe about uh, 40 years ago, a professor in the university said, why are we analyzing Filipinos through Sigmund Freud? Carl Jung and through the rats of Skinner. What do we have to do with the rats of Skinner? <laughs> but you know, Filipinas is so colonized that our universities have many copycat cultures of the universities in America. So if psychology is studying, is very intensive about Sigmund Freud, so we, we, we've been using that, and many psychologists in the urban areas are talking to an innocent, a more rural person and saying, yeah, the trouble with you is you're schizophrenic, huh? <laughs> What's schizophrenic? Can you eat that? Huh? <laughs> and 
And he said, let us look for a relevant psychology, an indigenous psychology, which is based on a core value of Filipinos. And after uh, several professors got together and they were able to discover something they call psychology of Filipino, <laughs> Filipino psychology, and they found a core value around which a lot of our behavior might, might revolve. And it's called Kapwa. Okay, Kapwa is when I, as an individual, include the other person. When I make any decisions, the other is important as to my personal decision. We are an including culture. I'm sure Mexicans, I feel it's here. Yui is very including when she's helping us find our way to the, <laughs> to the center a lot of people I met. I mean, this is in contrast to an industrial culture or a culture in New York or in Tokyo where the industrial economy is pitting you against each other. It's like a cockfight. What's a cockfight? Pelea de gallos, okay? Everybody is automatically mistrusting the other person. So you don't include people you, you don't trust. No? That's normal. But industrial culture has made us suspicious, less open. And I think if that is the kind of culture that is in, in the industrial countries, maybe that's why they have many films about serial killers. Maybe they have more films about lonely people who cannot cope with the world. But if our filmmakers start copying that model, because it's relevant maybe to New York, but Filipinos are like Mexicanos, more happy-go-lucky. <laughs> Let's have another tequila, amigo. <laughs> Tell me about your problem, your sweetheart, whatever. It's a... Uh, it's an openness of your cultura that maybe you get more close in the industrial country. Okay, I'm not giving a psychology, but, but I'm just saying we have a common culture and maybe that was started suppressed 500 years ago by those colonialistas españoles. Yeah. And maybe Filipinas is different from Mexico, we were really officially colonized by America. They put a governor general in Filipinas, governador general, and they created a, uh, political institutions and economic institutions like the banks and the uh, legislatura and the presidencia. You know, these were we were copies of American uh, of American. Uh, policy, and even capitalism as a way of controlling the smaller participants in the economy. Maybe you were not colonized by America, but because you were a neighbor of America, and because many immigrants have crossed to the other side, and they pick up the American dream, and they come back here, and they start their own big enterprise, maybe this is a common experience too. Plus the religion catholico. If you saw my film yesterday, and as I said, you can close your eyes, turn on your camera, turn 370 degree, and you will find in your footage two or three cathedral or capilla or a cross because it has stayed in spite of. Yeah, we are, we are free from Spain since 1898. We had a revolution against the Spaniards. And uh, when we were fighting a revolution, 
I just found out I said Hidalgo, who is your start who is your main hero to start the revolution? Hidalgo. Hidalgo, yeah. And we had Bonifacio. Bonifacio, you see him in my other film is also holding the the machete. So good man kapatid. Forward brothers, let's fight for democracy, for our freedom. And these kinds of uh, heroes are slowly getting lost to our youth. But anyway, that's another problem. But our common uh, fight for freedom against whether it's Americanos or Espanolas. And you add to that the layer of um, indigenous heroes. I'm sure that the Los Cuentos, the historians, the this pueblos in the Enosas have very many interesting figures who could be metaphors for libertad, you know? But because maybe the Christian or the invading Catholics said they were bad people. I just saw uh, in San Miguel de Allende una Modeo de Mascara. And I think I could see similarities because the Spanish were trying to suppress the local culture, but the mascaras were actually sometimes mocking the illustrados, no? the Spanish illustrados. Um, they, they would show fight between the Moros and the and the Spanish heroes. But the local artist would make, or the duende of that local artist would make the mask a little bit crazier. The Espanol is actually supposed to be the bad guy in their, in their village. The haciendero, maybe. But they had a way of incorporating in their stories. Maybe the outer layer is uh, a Western narrative that Catholic or Christian superhero versus the Muslim, the Moro, Moro. But by incorporating their own animal figures, sometimes you see a deer or a uh, jaguar, and wow, you can find another interpretation. But the colonialist sense of who is good and bad, we are good and you are bad and you have to come to us. Amen. Now you're good. What does that do to our cultura? Well, let's go more specific. What does it do to our storytelling? And there's so many stories that are waiting to be told. And because of our unique growing up with a mixture of, yeah, we cannot erase. No puede borrar. Borrar. No puede borrar the experience of colonial. But we can at least be aware which of those colonial experiences are suppressing us or suppressing our duende. And maybe because our collective duende in, in, in a country like Mexico or Filipinas is being suppressed and more of the people are trying to be like the cool guy in New York or the cool guy in Paris, that we are not contributing our fullest strength as, as, as citizens of our countries. We're not able to contribute our best self because we are trying to be like that guy that we saw in the Hollywood movie yesterday, driving a sports car, being cool with the girls, <laughs> or that super laser gun that can erase the bad King Kong. So again, um, uh, are we able to show now? Yeah. You're, you're connected. Ano ano na kakonjamen? Emoji. Okay. Um, now we can move to something that at least might illustrate what I'm talking about. For for the last hundred years, we have 
or even 200 years ago, believed that Magellan, Magallanes, I just the Filipinas. <laughs> we were always there before before he came. But then there's the wave of missionaries who told us, your gods are the work of the devil. Throw away your wood carvings. F follow the our hierarchy of gods and santos. And so in doing that, we are also losing some of our own connection to our strengths. So, as a filmmaker or storyteller, uh, let me try to be a revisionist of the story. I'll be a revisionist of history, and I'll say, no, Magellan is not the first person to go around the world. No, it's the primero circumnavigacion de Magellan Magallanes, pero este el esclavo de Magallanes. Yeah, he estaba the primero person here. But this is my creation, but it's also based on some historical facts. And they will never hear where the source of the wind from Inavian. You know, I just made, this is our very miniature sculpturas, but I just uh, had a major insulation, maybe a little bigger than this room, where I have life-size um, uh, statues of Inabian and Marlene Monroe. And then they're surrounded by other sculptures which show the culture battle. That was my insulation out there. This is World War III. It's about, it's not about bombs, it's not about missiles, it's about, it's a culture war. It's a, for the survival of these old stories. And in the background, I filled it up. So this is on the bottom, you have Martin Monroe and, and Inabian, maybe about life-size sculptures. And then in the background, you have missiles coming from Hollywood, and Spider-Man is riding on one of them, and Wonder Woman is riding on other missiles. These are the cultural bombardment from Hollywood. And they're being met by uh, boat-like vessels carrying wind gods who are blowing and trying to fight those uh, superheroes from the commercial uh, industry. So Wonder Woman and Captain America are being met by wind gods. Now, how will such a story get to the children, as your question is, and I think Oh, if I were younger, I would like to do an animation because children respond to that, no? An animation about Inapian, or Goddess of the Wind, or, or Bernardo Carpio, the, uh, is, is a, uh, uh, a man who's trapped in, two, in a cave and cannot get out, but it's, for me, it's a metaphor for the cultural entrapment that he has. He cannot get out. There are many of these uh, indigenous stories that would, uh, even in children's books. So you're right, I, my, if I had the resources or the means at the moment to do children's stories, I think they would be my first target. People of my generation and maybe the, the generation now are so brainwashed with the superheroes. And the superheroes always look like, like Clark Gable or Rock Hudson, <laughs> beautiful star, I mean, what they call beautiful. And, oh, there's a line in my film yesterday where the school children, it's Christmas time, and Philippines is a very Christmassy country. And uh, there's a, the Santa Claus is coming to give gifts, and everybody's excited, and Santa Claus is, coming from the American base. There's a American base in my city. And he's coming with a fire truck, red hat and everything, and nice jolly beard. And he said, maybe he's really a good man, but 
I have a question. Why can our why can Santa Claus be a nice old indigenous face? So that's a kind of an issue that it's going to take a lot more time. But I think there are tools. So I'm not anti-technology. I'm just that sometimes we become slave of the technology, and the technology is owned by the money funders, and they are meant for more making more money. But if we use these tools to awaken the youth to say, hey, Superman and Batman are not the only ones we can. We just pick up a few excitement moments, you know? It's like a, a hamburger, just an instant short thrill, but maybe 30 minutes later you're hungry. But maybe we have some really tasty stories from our past, from our ancestors. And I think if we can get those into new forms that children will appreciate, ah, there's hope, there's hope. So any of you here who will try to bring some of those Oaxaca stories or from the tribe that built the pyramids near here, look for those stories. Go to your abuelo and your abuela. Let them tell you some stories that you would never heard before and bring them into this world. Let me close. We have no more time. But anyway, you might all might think I'm I'm a contradiction. I'm, I have a Hollywood person here. But look, no, this is E.T. But he is in a taparabo. Okay, okay. He's, uh, he is connected to his indigenous roots, whether he's in, whether he's in Mars or wherever. And that's where his duende and strength comes from. Okay. So here he's near the rice terraces. He has uh, the the costume of a indigenous person. But they say, "Hey, don't treat us like aliens. Treat us with respect. Our indigenous culture has much to contribute to today's cultura." So I think Mexico and Filipinas we have a, lot, a big struggle to keep alive those old cultures, which our forefathers. Death to us.